Good afternoon. I'm James Schmelling. I'm the president and CEO of the National Defense University Foundation. I'd like to thank you for joining us today, and I'd like to extend particular thanks to Lidos for supporting all of the infrastructure necessary for us to do these national security briefing series. In addition, I'd like to thank our McNair partners and individuals who have supported the National Defense University Foundation and our work for the National Defense University. It's my privilege today to introduce Dr. Brian Greenwald, who's a provost, deputy provost and professor at National Defense University. Brian, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, James. Um, I believe my camera is operational, uh, or will be shortly. I have the honor uh, of introducing Lieutenant General Stephen Whiting, because Lieutenant General Plain, the NDU president, is currently hosting a day-long meeting of the Military Education Coordination Council. And sir, General Plain says it, sends his regrets and his best wishes um, I know if it weren't for the MEC, he would be here uh, introducing you and enjoying the conversation. Um, that said, I'm excited to have the privilege. Uh, General Whiting is a, the commander of Space Operations Command located at Peterson Space Force Base in Colorado. He's responsible for the preparation, generation, and sustainment of combat-ready intelligence, cyber, space, and combat support forces and serves as the U.S. Space Force service component to U.S. Space Command. He's a graduate of the Air Force Academy, holds master's degrees in administrative sciences and air power strategy, and importantly for National Defense University, is also a graduate of the Joint Forces Staff College, GPME 2 program, uh, phase two program. And sir, I believe you were there at the same time I was, although I don't recall us. You were probably uh, in the library, in the gym, burning the candle at both ends, and I was probably trying to get my lessons to, together for the next day. Um, we are blessed, uh, uh, everyone, to have him with us today. I know I am preaching to the converted here uh, in the audience of space-minded individuals who are, have tuned in for this, but space is critically important to all of us, not only as warfighters, but as citizens of the modern world, where we rely on position, navigation, and timing, PNT, in our everyday lives. Whether we're in our cars and using my Tesla navigation, or whether I'm going to the ATM, or we're you know, on my cell phone to do something. Those are simple space-based capabilities that we rely on as a civilization. As warfighters and as a former Patriot Battalion commander, I can tell you that space-based capabilities have, quote, made hitting a bullet with a bullet. Um, in other words, downing a ballistic missile much easier today because of the precision they provide than it was a few decades ago when I had to rely on a theodolite, a compass, and a computer the size of a small generator uh, to position a Patriot battery. As a military historian, I frequently challenge my sea service students on whether they could replicate this, the seamanship um, displayed by the Normandy invasion fleet, several thousands of ships as they sailed around Great Britain to rendezvous on the southern side at night under radio silence. And of course, the sea service officers say, yes, sir, we can. Not only can we navigate by the stars, but thanks to space-based capabilities, we have GPS. Um, and in short, we can fight without space-based cap capabilities, but we cannot do it well, and we cannot do it as exquisitely as necessary to prevail in the future operating environment. Those capabilities, their operations, as we'll learn today, and their continued development are critically important to the joint force. And with that, I'd like to yield the floor and welcome General White. Sir, the floor is yours. Hey, thanks, uh, Dr. Greenwald, uh, to you and Mr. Schmeling. Really appreciate the chance to be here. Uh, I, I definitely enjoyed my time as a student down at Norfolk. Uh, as you highlighted, I never was able to make it to Fort McNair as a student, so I appreciate the opportunity to be a speaker today. I think we have a video to get us started. I'd like to, to start that, and if you have any problems uh, seeing it or hearing it, please just let us know, and we'll uh, default out of it if that's the case. Today, space is essential not only to our way of life, it's absolutely critical to the modern way of war. GPS, ATMs, cell phones, gas pumps, traffic lights, power grids, guided missiles, surveillance, RPAs, ground combat control. There's no such thing as a day without space operations. You just don't see them. Earth is only half the battle. 
cyber attacks and jamming of our satellites, microsatellites that can create a debris field. At 17,000 miles an hour, a piece of metal the size of a coin can be weaponized. Now is the time for a military branch with a clear and singular focus on space. A military branch that protects the hopes and dreams of America and our way of life as the space domain becomes more and more contested. It's time for another giant leap. The United States Space Force is being built from the brightest minds across the space operations of the Air Force, our joint services, and the private sector. We aren't just getting ready for the near future. We're getting ready for the 22nd century. When our enemies ask, what if, we will have an answer. When foreign powers can build bases on the dark side of the moon, when private companies are inventing a new economy beyond our planet, we need to stay one step ahead of the future. The future is where we'll make history. We will fight in an environment with no up or down, no left or right, where there are no borders, and nowhere to hide. Our Space Force is defending our country here on Earth and wherever our mission takes us. As commerce and exploration expand, we will imagine the unimaginable, anticipate the inconceivable, and prepare for the impossible. We won't just think outside the box. We'll think outside the atmosphere. In one of the most challenging environments ever known, All right, so that's what I want to talk about today is uh, the U.S. Space Force and U.S. Space Command, two new organizations created uh, by the Department of Defense in 2019, uh, less than four years old, but it's Space Force, the sixth armed service in the United States, and then U.S. Space Command, the 11th Combatant Command. And there's one organization that sits at the nexus of those two organizations, and it's the command that I have the privilege to lead, Space Operations Command, or SPOC, and I'll tell you more about that as we get into the briefing. Let's go to the next slide. So as Dr. Greenwald highlighted, obviously uh, we are a society and a, and a national defense enterprise that has become dependent on space. Uh, there's so many things in our lives that we've become uh, just so, um, you know, we take for granted uh, that come to us from space, as Dr. Greenwald mentioned, like uh, global positioning. But it's far beyond that. Uh, space is now a location from which billions and billions of dollars of economic activity occurs each and every year where services like telecommunications, radio, uh, earth observation, imagery, all of that is now uh, available and sold to uh, governments, to companies, and, and even individuals. You can go and, and get internet from space now for a very modest amount. Um, and, and that's worth protecting uh, in our economy. Uh, but there's other ways that we don't see in our economy that we're relying on space, uh, such as critical infrastructure sectors, which are dependent on uh, GPS, like uh, stock markets and point of sale uh, devices that are synchronized in space and time uh, by the GPS signal. Uh, but our national defense is dependent on space as well. In fact, our entire joint force is sized with the assumption that space will be available through all levels of conflict. And what do I mean by that? You know, go back to World War II, there were about 150 million Americans and there were 12 million Americans under arms. Today, we're a country of about 330 uh, million Americans and there's somewhere around 1.4 million active duty uh, military personnel. Uh, a big reason for that is because we are much more precise and lethal uh, given the capabilities we have from space. So in World War II, there were individual bomber raids that had a thousand bombers over a single target complex. Each of those bombers had 10 to 15 airmen on board. So that means there were 10 to 15,000 airmen over a single target. And that's not including any escort fighters or weather aircraft. If there was 10% attrition over that target set, uh, that means 1,000 to 1,500 uh, airmen didn't come home. And at times, a single target complex would not even be destroyed with that mass of bombers. Well, today we'd prosecute that very differently, for example, with uh, with a couple B-2s, where now we have uh, maybe four airmen over the target set, not including some other support aircraft that might be there. Uh, and it's a lot of different technologies which have enabled that. 
uh, certainly jet engine uh, technology, stealth technology, global aerial refueling, but space is foundational to that because space lets us look over that next hill to know what's there, know what the threats are. Space enables command and control from a base back in the CONUS all the way around the planet. In fact, it untethers us from terrestrial networks and lets us know uh, what the signal environment is, what, what weather is going on and keeps us all networked together. So space is foundational to how the joint whole, entire joint force fights and the joint force cannot fight with the mass that it would need without space. So that's our job in US Space Force and US Space Command to ensure that we can provide those space capabilities through all levels of conflict. Next, please. And speaking of uh, threat, this slide is a qualitative assessment of threat going back to the, the Cold War. So on the vertical axis, you can see this qualitative assessment of where we were in, in a space threat environment. And on the horizontal axis, you see time from 1985 up until today. If you go to the far left and keep going off the slide to 1957, of course, the space race was birthed in great power competition between the Soviet Union and the United States, and the Soviet Union won that opening chapter of the space race when they launched Sputnik. Uh, all throughout the 60s and into the 70s, uh, the United States and the Soviet Union went to space for strategic advantage. Um, in the 70s, the Soviet Union uh, declared operational and anti-satellite weapon, or ASAT, as we call that, because they wanted to hold our space capabilities at risk. And into the 80s, we recognized the importance of defending our space capabilities, and we created the first version of US Space Command. And we kind of saw that threat picture crescendo right at the end of the 1980s, uh, as the uh, Cold War was ending. Um, the Soviet Union dissolved and, and Russia stopped investing in those kind of technologies. Uh, we fought what we call the first space war, Desert Storm, not because Saddam Hussein took us on in space, but because we, for the first time, used the entirety of our space systems, which had been built for strategic purposes, to enable tactical warfighting across the battlefield. And then we did have about a 17-year period from around 1990 to 2007, where we were in a benign space environment. Uh, Russia wasn't investing and China hasn't, had not uh, proven that they were sophisticated enough to try to hold us at risk in space. And then that changed in January of 2007 when China conducted an anti-satellite test against one of their own weather satellites at a relatively high altitude, uh, creating over 3,500 pieces of long-lived debris. And from that moment on, we have just seen the threats in space continue to increase with on-orbit weapons test uh, right up until uh, November of 2019 when uh, when uh, Russia, pardon me, November of 2021, when Russia conducted a, a hit to kill ASAT test. And of course, Russia is a sophisticated and historic space power, and yet they still conducted that test, leaving over 1,500 pieces of long-lived debris. Uh, so because of this rising threat in 2019, the, the nation created US Space Command in August of that year, and then US Space Force in December of that year. If you look down at the bottom of this slide, you'll see how congested uh, space has become. Uh, we are now tracking about 48,000 pieces of trackable debris on orbit. That number has gone up 90% in the last three years, and that's due to three reasons. Uh, one is the launch of mega constellations like Starlink and OneWeb. Those are commercial uh, telecommunications internet constellations. Um, the second reason being that Russian ASAT test and then some other unrelated breakups. And then the third reason being that we have uh, improved sensors now that can better track the objects that were al already on orbit, but that had previously been too small for us to track. Let's go to the next slide, please. So if I were to categorize today's space domain, I, I would use these three C words. It is highly commercial. In fact, I would say that we're in kind of a second golden age of space. If that first golden age of space was kind of from the launch of Sputnik up until uh, Neil Armstrong walked out onto the lunar surface in July of 1969, when there was so much excitement about space, I think we see a similar level of excitement today, except today it's being led by commercial industry with the just rapid expansion of commercial capabilities in space. Uh, as noted, uh, the space domain is congested. We are just seeing a rapid growth uh, in the number of objects on orbit. And then it is contested uh, with the threats we now see from China and Russia. And I have a statement here that says space enabled warfighting is dominant and high in conflict. I wanna be very clear about what I'm saying there. That does not say space warfighting is dominant. It says space enabled warfighting. 
And that represents the entire joint force and our allies, uh, all branches of the armed forces who now have become uh, dependent on these space capabilities uh, to be more effective and more lethal in their operations. Next, please. So when the Space Force was created after the passage of the National Defense Authorization Act in December of 2019, and the president signed that act, the Space Force was created. Um, and, and we are a small service, only about 8,600 uh, guardians with about that many uh, civilians that serve in our formations. And then we have about uh, six to 7,000 airmen that serve alongside us, and I'll talk more about that. Uh, but our Chief of Space Operations, the CSO, as we call him, is our service chief. Uh, he sits in the Pentagon with our headquarters Space Force staff. And then we've organized ourselves around three what we call field commands. Um, I command Space Operations Command, which is the operational arm of Space Force with all the operational capabilities that we present to combatant commanders. Uh, we have our, our lead acquisition command, which is known as Space Systems Command out at uh, Los Angeles Air Force Base in California. There are some other important organizations that also acquire for us, but SSC, as we call it, is our largest. And then we have Space Training and Readiness Command, which was built after an Army TRADOC model, uh, but it, it includes our kind of initial skills training, uh, our accession training, uh, but it also has our uh, Warfare Center training and our um, tactics, techniques, procedures, and doctrine development. Uh, then you see up on the uh, upper left there, we have three new smaller commands. Uh, we are in the process of standing up Space Force service components to geographic combatant commands other than U.S. Space Command. Uh, and so far, we've stood up three. We've stood up uh, Space Forces Indo-PACOM, Space Forces uh, Korea, and Space Forces Central Command. And we'll be standing up those commands uh, for the other geographic combatant commands uh, as we go forward. And then I just want to highlight uh, how flat we are in the Space Force, given our small scale and size. But on the upper right there, you see a, you see a, a triangle. If you were a, a, a a Lieutenant Colonel Squadron Commander in the Space Force, uh, you would have an E-7 or an E-8 as your senior enlisted leader, uh, you know, commanding probably uh, somewhere 100 to 200 people executing your mission. You report to an 06 commander of an organization called a Delta that is roughly uh, our, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's analogous to an Air Force Wing or an Army Brigade. And those Delta commanders report to a field commander like myself, and then I report up to the Chief of Space Operations or up to the uh, commander of U.S. Space Command. So a uh, very flat chain of command. Uh, and we did that intentionally to try to be as agile as possible. Next, please. So this is Space Operations Command, the uh, command that I, I have the privilege to lead. Uh, I've already talked about how we report up to the Chief of Space Operations. What you don't see on this slide is that I, I also am the Space Force Service Component to U.S. Space Command. Uh, of course, U.S. Space Command has a service component from each of the other services as well, uh, but as the only pairing of a service and a COCOM that are exclusively focused on the same domain, no surprise that the Space Force brings 90 to 95% of the operational capability uh, for U.S. Space Command. Uh, so the, the subordinate organizations to uh, Space Operations Command, if you start there on the right, the first is a two-star warfighting headquarters that we have at Vandenberg Space Force Base that we call uh, SPOC West or the Combined Force Space Component Command. That is a warfighting headquarters we give to U.S. Space Command, and they use it each and every day as one of their two joint commands that execute uh, warfighting on behalf of uh, U.S. Space Command. And, and this command is responsible for integrating space effects with terrestrial warfighters and other combatant commands around the globe. There to the left, you see two organizations called Space Base Delta One or Space Base Delta Two. Uh, these are our, our equivalents to uh, Air Force Air Base Wings or Army Garrisons. They are the commands that run our installations. So Space Base Delta One runs all of our installations here in the Colorado Springs area. That's Peterson Space Force Base, Schriever Space Force Base, Cheyenne Mountain Space Force Station, and it also has responsibility for Thule Air Base in Greenland, 700 miles north of the Arctic Circle. Uh, Space Base Delta II is responsible for running our installation at Buckley Space Force Base in the Denver, Colorado area. Both of these organizations are comprised primarily up to like the 98% level by U.S. Air Force airmen who are assigned to our formations running those installations. And they are vital to our success because just like uh, JP-8 fuels the U.S. Air Force and, and Navy and Marine Air, uh, HVAC and power fuel 
the U.S. Space Force because the vast majority of our forces are employed in place and operate from our installations. Um, so we really cannot do our mission without our airmen that, that execute those critical base uh, operations functions for us. And then along the bottom, you see our individual space deltas that run different aspects of our space missions. So space space delta, uh, pardon me, space delta two is uh, headquartered here at Peterson Space Force Base with units around the world that execute space domain awareness. That's tracking those 48,000 objects in space, but it's really so much more than that. It's about keeping custody of those threats uh, that we now see on orbit and uh, making sure that, that we have good situational awareness of what's going on uh, with those uh, objects. Space Delta Three is also here at uh, Peterson Space Force Base, but it has units deployed around the world. Now this Delta looks the most like the other services in that typically with this Delta, we generate combat power and then deploy to uh, forward locations to execute electromagnetic warfare missions, offensive and defensive. And then those rotational forces will come back home uh, and either be replaced by another uh, detachment that will go out behind it, or uh, you know, we'll finish a mission and then just bring them home. Uh, Space Delta IV is at Buckley Space Force Base up in Denver. Uh, this is our global missile warning delta. If I were to ask, you know, what kind of distinguishes the U.S. military from other militaries, there's a lot of things you can answer. You might talk about uh, the, the B-2 bombers that can go anywhere around the world and strike a target within moments, or our ability to put multiple aircraft carriers uh, to sea, or our ability to, to uh, you know, drop a Ranger regiment uh, within a matter of hours anywhere. Um, you might, not min you might not think to mention global missile warning, but it truly does distinguish us that any launch around the world, we are uh, providing that warning to, to national leaders and to fielded forces within moments uh, to make sure that, uh, that, that you know, we are not held at risk by others' uh, missile and rocket capabilities. Space Delta V is at Vandenberg Space Force Base in California. This is our command and control capability. Um, it, is, it was kind of built off an Air Force AOC model, uh, but we have, we have fine-tuned that for uh, space operations needs. Space Delta VI is here at Schriever Space Force Base. It is our defensive cyber organization, and I'll talk more about that in a moment, but defending our space weapon systems, our space mission systems in the cyber domain is absolutely vital to us. And this organization also runs our satellite control network, which is a, a series of antennas around the world that allow our space operators, wherever they sit, to talk to our satellites and to retrieve the information uh, that, they, uh, that they produce. Space Delta Seven is headquartered here at Peterson Space Force Base with units uh, all over uh, the country. Uh, it is our intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance uh, delta. So these, this is where our intel guardians primarily live and what we've done is we've, we've centralized them in this delta, but then we've created detachments that sit with each of the other deltas, bringing the tactical intelligence that our space operators and cyber operators need as they're executing their missions. Space Delta Eight is also out at Schriever. It is where we uh, command and control the GPS constellation, but it also now has responsibility for all Department of Defense military satellite communications. Over the last eight or nine months, we have brought in the uh, MILSATCOM that the US Army and US Navy used to be responsible for, and now all of that is centralized in the Space Force in Delta-8. Uh, Space Delta-9 is our uh, orbital warfare delta, executing protect and defend operations uh, on orbit uh, against the threats we now face, and it is headquartered out at Schriever Space Force Base. And then finally, we have Space Delta 18, uh, which is at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. This is the Space Force's National Space Intel Center. It is our service intelligence center. Every service in the US has its own intelligence center, and this is ours co-located with the Air Force's uh, intelligence center, executing those foundational and scientific uh, intelligence responsibilities for our service. Next, please. Obviously, I've highlighted the threats we now face with China as a, a you know, our key challenge. Uh, China's uh, growth in space has truly been breathtaking uh, over the last 15 or 20 years, and they are clearly, uh, you know, they've clearly studied us since the uh, Desert Storm conflict, uh, and and they have built systems to hold us get hold us at risk, whether those are reversible uh, jammers uh, or direct descent ASATs or on-orbit co-orbital ASATs. We've seen all of those kind of tests from the Chinese. We've also seen the Chinese really work to network their forces more by space as they seek to 
uh, push out their ability to project power from their coasts. Uh, of course, Russia is a, a historic and sophisticated space power, and we've seen them also continue now to develop their threats, as I mentioned, with the, uh, the hit to kill ASAT test that they executed just 14 or 15 months ago. Uh, Russia as a continental power is not as dependent on uh, space with their own military forces, but certainly they have uh, military space capabilities. Next, please. So here I'll, I'll just highlight the importance of intelligence in our um, order of battle inside of Space Operations Command. Uh, you know, we like to say our, our first priority is to generate combat-ready, intelligence-led, cyber-secure space and combat support forces. So everything we do must be relative to the threats we now face. Uh, we now face, and so uh, having the tactical and operational strategic intelligence we need to inform our operations is vital. So inside of Space Operations Command, as I highlighted, we have the, those tactical ISR forces in Delta-7, uh, and then we have uh, the strategic level ISR forces uh, at the National Space Intel Center, and then we have operational intelligence at our command and control nodes in Delta-5 as well. So making sure we have intelligence at all levels to inform us. Next, please. And then when we're intelligence led, let's go ahead to the next build, we have to be cyber secure. Uh, why do I say that? Because space networks by their definition are global. They wrap around the planet, but then they extend out to 22,000 miles to geosynchronous orbit as well. And this creates a lot of novel cyber attack surfaces. And so we think about cyber as our soft underbelly, if you will. Uh, yes, China and Russia are building capabilities to hold us at risk on orbit, uh, but it's, it's much cheaper to do and it's harder to attribute if they do that in the cyber domain. Uh, and then countries like uh, Iran and North Korea, uh, not yet sophisticated enough to take us on in the space domain, but certainly uh, they might try to use the cyber domain to try to hold us at risk. So we are building out what we call mission defense teams or MDTs, which are staffed by cyber guardians uh, who persistently seek to defend our space um, systems uh, to make sure that, that we are secure in the cyber domain. It's a very important effort that we have ongoing in US Space Force. Next, please. And then on this slide, I just wanna briefly talk through kind of all the capability. Sometimes we talk about space, but it's not always clear that uh, everyone fully understands what the capabilities are that we have. So starting on the bottom right, we have satellite command and control centers at a number of locations from which our guardians are able to, to talk to their satellites. Uh, we have space electromagnetic warfare, as I highlighted, that we can deploy around the world when needed. We have missile warning radars, 10-story uh, radars that ring North America and are in Greenland and, and, and in a partnership in the UK uh, that help uh, defend North America from missile launches. We have space domain awareness radars and telescopes that are uh, around the world helping us to maintain track and custody of those threats that are in uh, on orbit and all the other debris and active satellites that are on orbit. We have our uh, satellite control network that I highlighted that allows us to talk to and retrieve data from our satellites. And then we have about uh, 9,000 guardians, airmen, and civilians that are assigned uh, into Space Operations Command. And as we work now up into orbit, in low Earth orbit, we have weather satellites that we, we fly in partnership with the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. We have space domain awareness satellites that help us to track other satellites that are and, and debris that are on orbit. If we go up to medium Earth orbit now, out to about 12,000 uh, miles, um, we have all of our GPS uh, various variants uh, satellites uh, uh, that are part of that constellation. And then up to geosynchronous orbit now, 22,000 miles above the Earth's surface, we have all of our uh, military satellite communication satellites. Um, we have space domain awareness satellites, and then we have our missile warning satellites. And there at about the two o'clock position, you see the highly elliptical orbit uh, regime, which helps us to um, maintain uh, coverage over the poles. And there we have communication satellites and missile warning satellites. Next, please. As we get near the end here, I want to highlight that we recognize space as a team sport. Uh, no single country or agency can execute all the missions that need to be done, and we certainly are stronger when we operate with our allies, and we do operate extensively with our allies. Uh, as you can see there on the left part of the slide, here in my headquarters, uh, I have uh, Canadian and Australian uh, exchange and liaison officers. In fact, uh, the Royal Canadian Air Force uh, has has uh, given us an exchange one-star general who is a part of my staff as my deputy commanding general for transformation. 
at our Space Delta II, that space domain awareness uh, delta, we have uh, Australians, Canadians, and, and British personnel that work right alongside of our personnel. Uh, Space Delta III, we have partnerships with the uh, Australians and the British. Space Delta IV, if you go to Buckley and walk out onto our ops floor there, it may very well be an Australian, a Canadian, or a British crew commander who's running that crew, executing that global missile warning mission that I talked about a moment ago. At Space Delta VIII, we have Australians folded in. And then on the right side, you can see all the other partnerships in, in concert with US Space Command. Uh, we execute a named operation uh, with Australia, Canada, and the UK each and every day called Operation Olympic Defender, which is about uh, supporting the safe operations uh, in space. Uh, out at Vandenberg, we have a multinational space collaboration office, which includes those countries, plus France, Germany, and Japan that have liaison officers sitting there so we can coordinate how we work best together. And then we just have a number of partnerships, for example, where we share space situational awareness information uh, with all of the countries that you see listed, plus a number of other uh, industry partners and academic institutions. Next, please. I'll close with this, uh, this quote by General Bernard Schriever. General Schriever was uh, the, the uh, godfather, if you will, of the uh, Air Force's rocket programs uh, and the Air Force's space programs. And in 1957, the year that Sputnik was launched, um, you know, he, he foresaw a time that may be coming where um, you know, controlling the ultimate high ground, the battles that occur there in space, uh, may become the most important battles going forward. Uh, we're not there yet, but certainly we have seen the rise and importance of space uh, for the entire joint force and for our nation. And, and certainly uh, he was prescient with those words uh, now over well over 60 years ago. So that concludes my prepared remarks. And uh, I look forward, uh, Dr. Greenwald and Mr. Schmeling, uh, to, to the questions. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate that. The um, interesting areas here are, I mean, they're fascinating to me. There's so much here that I didn't know. And this was a, a really, really good briefing. I think it gave a great overview. And in fact, you've already answered a couple of the questions that have come in from the audience. Uh, I'll, I'll acknowledge Kevin Humphrey in particular asked about a team sport. I'm gonna jump on that team sport one for one minute. And you noted that you have 115 industry partners in this team sport. And so I'll elaborate a little bit and, and ask what does the private sector play a role in specifically? That's an awful lot of uh, private sector partners. Yeah, and I mentioned earlier that I, I feel like we are in this second golden age of space really being led by industry and, and, and we cheer that on because it is fantastic for us in the Space Force and Space Command to have uh, you know, such innovative industry partners. Uh, but of course, across our formations today, uh, we. We have a number of places that we leverage uh, U.S. industry. Uh, they help operate some of our, our equipment through contract uh, relationships we have. Uh, we, we contract for services and using their capabilities. Uh, so, for example, you know, not everybody needs to use a bespoke built military uh, communication satellite. We go to industry and, and uh, contract for a lot of just commercial SATCOM that can be leveraged across the joint force. Um, we're seeing more and more opportunity to do that as well in mission areas like space domain awareness. There is a thriving commercial industry now that is tracking objects on orbit and then creating services from that and selling that to others in the commercial industry. Uh, and, and we can leverage some of that data to help fill in gaps we may have or, or help us with our resiliency. And so we see a lot of opportunity there. I'll also highlight that we have some unique relationships with some of our, uh, our, our largest commercial providers out at Vandenberg. It sits alongside our Combined Space Operations Center, but we've created something called the Commercial Integration Cell, where about 10 companies have, uh, have come together with us and they cooperate, even though they compete for contracts elsewhere, at this location, they all cooperate and we share insights on threats and insights into what's going on with our various constellations because that helps us all operate uh, more, uh, more effectively and more safely uh, on orbit when we have better insight into what's going on. Can you tell me a little bit more about how that's led? Is that led from one of your military officers? Absolutely. So out at the Combined Force Space Component Command at Vandenberg, we have a, a small office there. Uh, and then those, those companies have come together and they've hired uh, an individual who, who sits in our ops center out there to help you know, 
liaise with us. And so it's a it's a contribution uh, through a uh, through a and a formal agreement that we have with those companies where where we contribute personnel and they contribute personnel, and then we create that better sense of shared understanding. Well, that's really interesting, and it aligns with things we're seeing in other parts of the defense community. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to ask a follow-on question there around this team sport piece, and uh, Stephen Abelli um, asks uh, from the Department of State, and he's with CISA, how concerned are you about the lack of international agreements or treaties regarding the peaceful and non-military use of space given the Chinese as well as the Russians are developing space-based weapons? Yeah, thank you for that question. And, you know, this is a, a topic that certainly State Department has lead on uh, inside the federal government. Uh, you know, uh, there are some agreements that are out there. There's the Outer Space Treaty um, and, and there are some other agreements. And, and, and you know, what we want to see is all actors being professional, being, you know, showing due regard, uh, acting safely on orbit. And certainly the Secretary of Defense has signed out a set of principles that govern that type of behavior. And for us in the Department of Defense, that's directive. We have to operate that way. And so what we want to see is, uh, you know, as more and more partners adopt those kind of uh, uh, norms, if you will. And by the way, we support what the United Kingdom has done in the in the UN to get, uh, you know, some resolutions passed there. Um, because when more and more operate that way, when people don't operate that way, it's more noticeable and visible. It's kind of like when you're on the interstate and in the flow of traffic, uh, and then when somebody goes racing by 50 miles an hour of the speed limit, they stick out because everybody else is operating the same way. So we think the first next step is, hey, let's get all spacefaring nations operating according to those uh, you know, voluntary norms so that we can see when there is bad behavior, and then we can figure out going forward if, if more needs to be done beyond that. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, one of our prior National War College commandants, Chad Mansky, asked a little bit about your evolving role with NORAD and uh, aerospace warning and control missions, if there are any. Yeah, and let me say hi to Joe Mansky, a uh, longtime friend. We go way back. Um, you know, we definitely support NORAD uh, because NORAD, as a treaty organization between the United States and Canada, has responsibility for aerospace warning. Now, we have the missile warning forces, and we provide that data to U.S. Space Command, but then ultimately it's the commander of NORAD who makes the assessment for the leadership of the United States and Canada of whether North America is under attack. So we provide those that data that ultimately he makes that assessment on. Uh, so that's primarily where we provide uh, that support. And then, of course, any military organization is leveraging you know, other capabilities we provide, like uh, uh, position navigation and timing, satellite communications. Um, and, and so there are definitely other ways that we support, but it's the, primarily through that missile warning aspect, Chad, that, that we are supporting Commander NORAD. So I'll continue on a little bit with the um, conversation about team sports. Um, we have a, a question from uh, Meter and uh, Matt Verich there. He said, General Dickinson made remarks recently about using Navy, Navy Aegis ships to help with space awareness. How is that done? Yeah, and U.S. Space Command has done some really nice work there, uh, working with the Navy, uh, with the Army, uh, with other agencies that have sensors that uh, might have another primary mission or might have been built for another purpose, but if they can be leveraged to track objects on orbit, that can help us uh, to, uh, to, you know, to fill in some gaps and, and, and have better information. And so, U.S. Space Command has been working with their Navy component, uh, Navy Space Command, which is dual-hatted with uh, Navy Cyber Command, uh, to leverage into the U.S. Navy and to make the relationships there to, to leverage that. I'll leave that to U.S. Space Command and the Navy to talk about those command and control arrangements, uh, but certainly I think it's a lot of good work to, to better leverage capabilities that the nation has already purchased. All right, so uh, Gerald Epstein, who's a faculty member here and researcher here at NDU, says there are a number of research institutions that fire high power lasers into the atmosphere or space, e.g. lunar ranging, adaptive optics with laser produced guide stars, et cetera. Do you provide deconfliction so that these entities know to avoid satellites? And do you provide that to any other institutions in other countries? In any case, how does one get them to avoid satellites whose existence or location we prefer not to acknowledge? That's a complex question and one you may not be able to fully answer, but uh, it's from a faculty member here. 
Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, and and we there is an organization, it doesn't work with SPOC, but it works alongside SPOC uh, called the Laser Clearinghouse. It's actually a part of US Space Command uh, and it works out at Vandenberg alongside Delta Five and the Combined Space Operations Center out there. Uh, but but they are the ones who who do the clearing, if you will, when a, a laser is going to be shot for scientific purposes or, or some other purpose, and they make sure that uh, that laser doesn't hit anything it's not supposed to hit. Um, and it's a it's a complex mission uh, for a com you know complex answer for a complex question. Uh, but but there is a team at Vandenberg that does that. Thank you. We've got a lot of questions from the audience today, and so we're not getting to the prepared questions, but I think these are interesting. Um, so I hope you'll uh, continue with those. So every activity and mission we have just seen today depends on electricity. And you talked about this with your Delta One and Delta Two in particular. What is Space Command doing to protect and ensure sources of energy? Yeah, and uh, you know, in this case, it's it's U.S. Space Force that runs these installations with our Air Force partners, and so we are we are working to ensure that we have uh, resilient infrastructure, um, and that is something that we that we work diligently here to be able to assess our infrastructure and make sure that we have various levels of redundancy uh, that allow us to have confidence that we can operate through uh, electrical power disruptions. Um, you know. No surprise that, that that's something commercial industry in many places, the financial network, uh, you know, uh, cloud uh, facilities, uh, they also have to think about, you know, how many nines of, uh, of reliability do you have and how do you build that into your systems? And so we have some uh, very smart Air Force civil engineers that, that work that with us, uh, but it is definitely something we're focused on because as I, as I did mention, HVAC and power fuel the US Space Force. And I'll add to that question a little bit around renewables and sustainable because you're all over the world and you uh, operate antennas and ground stations and other things everywhere. How does that play into it with all of the renewable energy and sustainable energy concerns in many countries? Certainly the US government has uh, goals for sustainable energy and, and transitioning uh, toward uh, more green energy. And, and as we are able, we take advantage of those through uh, you know, solar, whether, whether solar farms or, or working with the local um, providers on solar credits. Um, in some, some locations that doesn't make sense, but where we can, we're trying to, to leverage that to best effect, always ensuring that we have the reliability that we talked about earlier. Wonderful, thank you very much. A uh, question from a student at uh, US, he's at USAID, but he's at the Eisenhower School. To what extent do you see opportunities to broaden our partnership base to include developing countries that have not traditionally been involved in space activities, but have an interest in these capabilities? Is this a potentially useful element of strategic competition? I absolutely think it is. And in fact, uh, at each of the geographic combatant commands, um, there is a team of guardians who work alongside that combatant command. And over time, those will become those uh, component commands that I talked about. But those teams advise and work with those, that combatant commander and his or her staff to understand those relationships and those AOR. And, and there are uh, those kind of relationships being built. Uh, for example, we sent a team of guardians down to the FADAI air show in Santiago, Chile uh, last year, uh, because we think those are critical partnerships in South in Southcom. Uh, and if we're not there, then uh, you know maybe the Chinese would be there. And so we wanna be there leveraging those democratic countries uh, there to form partnerships and and help them in their space aspirations, uh, while we also uh, you know seek to derive benefit from those relationships. So uh, we do see this as a growing area, and we see growing interest from countries that have not traditionally been considered spacefaring. Thank you. Do you see particular gaps in your capabilities or capacities that you think the private sector should or could fill? Well, you know, you always want more of a capability. And so when you see that capability and can go leverage it, that's fantastic. So in the intelligence community, obviously we've seen the growth in the uh, commercial uh, earth observation and imagery uh, sphere. And so that means, you know, you can we can work with those companies to contract and leverage uh, that capability. Uh, we have seen that similarly in satellite communications. We don't want to build uh, all the uh, satellites that are needed to support SATCOM. We want to build the bespoke 
kind of capabilities that we need for uh, the, the military applications while leveraging as much commercial as we can. Uh, and then I highlighted earlier, we see a, a burgeoning and growing area in space to, uh, domain awareness. And, uh, and that can help us when they build sensors in parts of the world where we may not have all the coverage or redundancy that we would like, uh, we can go work to leverage that uh, data as well. So again, this is the reason we're so excited about the growth in uh, the American space sector and allied space sectors, commercial space sectors, uh, because it does give us the ability to, to leverage that, uh, those, those uh, sources and those uh, you know, systems as they come online. You talked a little bit earlier about the combatant commands and how you support those. Can you elaborate a little bit on how you partner with the combatant commands and ensure that they have access to all of your resources? Absolutely. Uh, no surprise, the vast majority of uh, the capability that SPOC has as the operational arm of U.S. Space Force is presented to U.S. Space Command. Uh, but there is other capability that is forward deployed that is uh, you know, under the command of various uh, geographic combatant commands. And, and over time, uh, there may be more of that. Uh, we, we have some uh, well-established processes today where those other combatant commands working with the guardians that are forward deployed with them uh, can request space uh, effects, if you will, through the Combined Space Operations Center and get the support that they need uh, from space. And those are, you know, decade-long relationships that we've had. Uh, and as we continue to stand up those Space Force service components in the other uh, geographic combatant commands, I think those relationships will only richen and, and deepen as, as those, um, those new commands uh, even further integrate with the combatant commands that they're supporting. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to, uh, to share a little bit of a, a question here that I'm not sure you're going to um, want to address, but again, I'm trying to be responsive to our audience. And since each space-based system is vulnerable to physical attack, has any weaponized space-based system been launched by any nation? So it's, I think, awareness of what else other nations have done. Well, I've highlighted that we've seen, uh, you know, hit to kill ASAT tests, um, you know, just, just in the last uh, 18 months. Um, and so certainly we've seen those systems um, tested and uh, those, are, those are capabilities now that we have to be postured uh, relative uh, to. And so uh, our, our job, as I said at the beginning, is to ensure that the joint force and our allies have access to space effects through all levels of conflict and in the face of the threats we now face. All right, a question from one of our alums. Uh, what do you see the role of Space Force in joint operations? Yeah, we're a full member of the joint force. Now I did mention our size and we are small. We have to punch above our weight class, if you will. Let me just you know, very quickly just summarize that size again. And, and these are rough numbers and I apologize to any of my sister service mates if I don't get them exactly right. But I think the US Army is around 475,000 active duty soldiers plus guard and reserve on top of that. I think the US Navy is around 330,000 active duty sailors plus a reserve on top of that. The Air Force is somewhere around 320,000 active duty airmen with a guard and reserve on top of that. Um, the, I think the US Marine Corps is somewhere around 175,000 Marines active duty with a reserve on top of that. The Coast Guard is about 45,000 uh, active duty Coast Guardsmen. I think they have a reserve on top of that. We're 8,600 guardians, you know, uh, six or seven or 8,000 airmen and, and about that many uh, um, civilian guardians. That's about 24,000-ish writ large, and we are a full teammate on the joint force. You may not see us out in the joint force as much just because of our numbers, but we have to enable joint force lethality and effectiveness because the joint force is depending on us and is sized with the assumption that those capabilities will get there or will be there. So uh, you will see in, in at all joint staffs, whether that is the joint staff in Washington, OSD, whether it's the combatant commands, you will see guardians. Again, we'll be small in number, but you should expect those guardians to pull their full weight, uh, making sure that space is fully integrated into the operations of each of those staffs. Thank you. Um, from a student, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Brian Chapman in the Eisenhower School, can you talk to the relationship between Spock and US Spacecom with regards to the space superiority realm? Deltas three, five, and nine sound similar to mission briefs we've heard from US Spacecom. Also from a multilateral perspective, what are their additional touch points in Spacecom or do they re reside in uh, Space Operations Command? Yeah, it's a multifaceted question and it really is not 
that different than uh, uh, any other relationship between a combatant command and a service component. So certainly General Dickinson and US Space Command is the Title X COCOM warfighter in space who gives the direction, has uh, you know COCOM, uh, and then he has all of his service components, which Spock is, and then we generate, present, and sustain those forces and, and present them to him. Uh, and then they execute the, the missions and the orders that flow down from US Space Command. So Deltas three, five, and nine are uh, you know, a part of Spock, but when they're executing um, COCOM missions, those commands are flowing down through uh, US Space Command under their authorities. So again, really not different than other combatant commands and service components, uh, but obviously we do have a very close relationship uh, given that both of us are focused on the same domain. Great, thank you. Um, and he extends his thanks as well as have several others who have uh, asked questions. Uh, I will encourage our audience to continue to ask questions. I've asked, I think, most all of those. I'm going to go back to uh, one that we talked about ahead of time, and, and that is what is the most important thing you want our students and faculty to understand here about Space Operations Command and Space Force broadly, and how about the public? You know, I, I, I just kind of got this question two or three ago, which was, you know, what is our role in the joint force? Uh, yes, we're, 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 we're new, we're young, we're just over three years old, you know, uh, those of you who are parents, uh, you know, we're kind of the toddlers bouncing off the walls with a lot of energy, uh, but we are a full teammate on the joint force now. Um, and, and the reason that we were stood up is, is really threefold. Number one is to ensure that we, the United States has freedom of action in space. Um, you know, we don't want to be constrained by the actions of others. We want to be able to leverage space for all the goodness that it brings uh, the U.S. and our allies. We, we also want to leverage it for national defense purposes when, when called upon. Uh, the second reason is to enable joint lethality and effectiveness uh, because the joint force is dependent on us. And then third, like all the military services, we, we want to be able to provide independent options to the national leadership. So that's the number one thing that I want uh, the rest of the joint force to know is that uh, that you need to count on us and, and be a demanding customer of us as a full part of, of this broader team. And then for the U.S. public, you know, we just want them to, to get to know that the Space Force is real. Uh, you know, we are small, and so not a lot of people have had a chance to meet a guardian. Uh, what we do is, is, is not always tangible because we're operating systems typically that are on orbit, uh, but they affect each and each and every one of us in our daily lives. And so, uh, you know, we just want to, the U.S. public to understand that, that we're a part of this national defense team as well. And uh, we look forward to those young men and women out there who are interested in joining us, uh, you know, coming by and talking to us as well. Uh, that actually raises a question. Do you have a, a recruiting team out there similar to the other services or do they go through, uh, through an Air Force recruiter? Yeah, we were built to leverage the U.S. Air Force to the maximum extent possible. So to answer your question, we leverage the Air Force Recruiting Service, and they are they are fantastic partners. There are dedicated teams of Guardian recruiters. A uh, young man or woman can walk into their local recruiting shop where they likely will talk to an airman, and if they say they're interested in the U.S. Space Force, that team will come to bear supporting that airman recruiter and that young man or woman as they express interest in the, the U.S. Space Force. Uh, I will highlight there's only five career fields in the U.S. Space Force. The first three I name are officer and enlisted. That's space operations, cyber, and intelligence. And the last two are uh, officer only, and that's development engineer and acquisition. Everything else it takes to run the U.S. Space Force either comes to us from the U.S. Air Force or our civilian uh, teammates. And so uh, they are critical parts of that team as well. So then the last question that I have from the audience at the moment is, uh, well, actually I'm gonna combine two, they're both about cybersecurity. Um, how would you characterize cybersecurity's current support to the space infrastructure enterprise and how could that improve? And then a more detailed question from a student who's, in the, uh, who's at USAID, could, can you please talk about the cyber teams you mentioned, given the importance of cybersecurity as the soft underbelly you're worried about, how are you staffing? Are they full-time cyber experts? Are they communications officers from the Air Force? And finally, what are your concerns, if any, for cyber staffing in Space Force? And apologies, I'm reading very small print, so I was going a little slow. <laughs> okay, uh, you know, I'll start with the back end of that question there. These uh, mission defense teams 
they are um, uniformed cyber guardians who uh, have come to us, yes, a lot from the Air Force, but we also have brought over guardians who started in the Army, Navy, and Marine Corps, uh, and they are being trained now to do defensive cyber operations for space work. That's part of a multi-level uh, defensive scheme that we have. You kind of start with with cybersecurity, baking in cyber into the systems that you buy, but then you have these mission defense teams of cyber guardians who persistently are monitoring those networks. They become familiar with the traffic on those networks and that helps them to detect anything untoward or malicious on the network. Um, and then US Cyber Command has their cyber protection teams, which are maneuver elements that can come and, and assist and help with that kind of work as well. Um, and, and so there's multiple levels here of cyber defense. Uh, we are building out those mission defense teams now, and uh, we'll continue to build that out uh, as we go forward. Of course, we'd always like more faster. Uh, maybe that gets after the first part of the question, uh, but, uh, but I think we're making good progress uh, at this time. Uh, and in the future, we'll, we'll continue to develop our relationship with US Cyber Command as we think about standing up a service component for, for Cyber Command as well. So another question around your uh, force, how are you going to retain space professionals without a guard or reserve component offering continuum of service options? Or are you going to rely on the guard and reserve components of other services? You know, today we rely on the Air National Guard and the Air Force Reserve. Um, and if there's a change to those, you know, the composition of those, uh, those uh, two components, uh, that will have to come from the U.S. Congress um, and, and any legislation that they pass. But today we get outstanding support from the Air Force Reserve and the Air National Guard. We could not execute our missions without them. Uh, and we, we do see, you know, uh, guardians uh, leaving active duty as, as people do in the services and going into those. And we love it when, they're, when their expertise is captured in those reserve components so we can continue to leverage that going forward. So we'll see what happens as we, we move forward. But until then, uh, we, we are in deep partnership with the Air Force Reserve and the Air National Guard. This has been incredibly informative. Thank you very much. We have about two minutes. So I'm gonna to turn to you and ask if you have any closing comments or, or parting thoughts before we close this and give you the last word. Well, again, I appreciate the opportunity to come and, uh, and to speak to the National Defense University Foundation. Um, you know, what the students are going through right now in pro professional military education is uh, incredibly important. Uh, not only is the, the, uh, ac are, are the academics important and the relationships you form with your fellow students, but it does give you time to pause and think. And if you haven't spent time in your busy uh, military or interagency career, uh, thinking about uh, where the United States is headed in space, and what space means to our country, I think this is a time to do that uh, because we are at, uh, at a period in time where the, the, the nation three years ago just said, we are not organized properly to defend ourselves in this domain. And that's resulted again in the standup of the Space Force and Space Command. And, and so now there's a, there's a you know, 100 processes, maybe more than that, that have to be updated now to reflect that we have a new service, we have a new combatant command, um, and, and now we've got to you know, do all the hard work to make sure that as we move forward, we can uh, assure the American people and the joint force that those uh, space capabilities will be available when called upon in the face of the threats we now, we now face. So uh, it's a privilege to be teamed with uh, the rest of the joint force. And again, I very much appreciate James the opportunity to speak today. General White, thank you very much. I, I greatly appreciate all of your um, sharing comments on and information about Space Operations Command, Space Force, and the space domain, and all of the ways that it links to all the joint operations and the experiences that our students have. Thank you for making time in your busy schedule. I know you just got off an airplane, and I appreciate it very much. Um, thank you to all of our audience and participants for coming and sharing a little bit of your time. I hope this is useful. We always welcome suggestions for people who we should feature and organizations who we should highlight on these national security briefings. And I want to, again, thank Lidos for all of the infrastructure support to host these briefings and all of our other McNair partners for your support for the National Defense University through the National Defense University Foundation. Again, thank you very much. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone.